Today I'm going to talk about um, other voltage-gated channels. So last time we talked about uh, the voltage-gated channels that cause the spike. And so they, there's a sodium, fast sodium channel that opens up really quickly. It inactivates, which means it closes, even if it's depolarized. And that's what causes the, basically, that's what causes the spike to go, go down, uh, down the axon in one direction or the other direction. Um, so today what we want to talk about is you could easily make a whole class on what I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, I sort of, I call it channelology. So there's all these different channels uh, in, your, uh, in your brain and uh, they're sensitive to different neurotransmitters, but often you have multiple, for a given neurotransmitter, you have multiple channels and they're, all inter and they're all kind of complexly interacting with each other. And so what we want to do is talk about a subset of them, which are the, the voltage-gated channels that are in dendrites. So dendrites, it turns out, have a lot of voltage-gated channels in them, even though they don't generally propagate spikes up and down the dendrite. And these are used in complicated ways to sort of shape how the how the neuron responds. And so we'll, we'll try to sort of just dig into that and just sort of see this whole, this whole network of different channels and how they interact with each other and how they can shape cell behavior. But before I do that, uh, let's just look at an actual voltage-gated channel from last time. So, uh, so if we go over here uh, on the slide, so this, so this, this thing over here, this whole guy uh, is a voltage-gated channel. And the membrane, the, you know, the lipid bilayer membrane is running something, something like this. So that's, that's the lipid bilayer that I drew you know, last time uh, with a little you know, cholesterol, something like that. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the, actual, the actual cell membrane. And what you see in it, so, that, so where's the channel? You wonder, like, where's the actual hole that, that opens up? And th this thing is the actual channel right here, uh, the actual ion channel where the ions uh, go through. Um, and so then you've got some stuff out here. So, so these things are basically the receptors. So this, this channel can be affected by other things, other things than voltage. There's some stuff sticking up. And then... Over here, you can see there's, this is one of those alpha helices that I was drawing. So that's 3.6 amino acids per turn. So the amino acids kind of stick off here. And these are little oily amino acids sticking off of the alpha helix here. So that's the oily part. So that the, this, this whole protein, this whole thing is, is basically just one protein that inserts itself uh, into the membrane. And uh, so now if we, um, if we look at it from the top, so that was, so I didn't, I didn't say that. So, so that's looking at it from the side. So now if we rotate it, sorry, and, and look at it from the bottom. Okay, so this, this is, the, this is the, uh, the bottom down here. So let's rotate it and look at it, look at it from the bottom. So let me uh, erase, see if we can... Almost. Okay, so now, now we're looking at it from, uh, from, the t from the bottom. And so now you can clearly see the, the pore here. So that's where the ions actually go through. There's, there's, there's some crud in the pore because they, they stuck something in the pore uh, when they made this picture. From, it's a cryo-electron microscope picture. So, so now from the, from the top, you can see that those yellow things that stick through the membrane these guys are the voltage-gated part. So, so these guys are the voltage-sensitive part. There's four of them. They're kind of sticking out. They're inside the membrane, because you can see here, the, here, they, here they are over here. It's the same thing. Uh, so they're, they're actually inside the membrane. And those are the ones that actually cause the channel to open when the voltage changes. But the other thing you can see here, interestingly, is is this, this little guy right here. 
And this little guy is a little, it's a little flap that can actually sort of rotate down and close the channel. And it turns out that's the actual thing that does the inactivation, the, the voltage. So it's, it's, it's voltage sensitive, this little thing, uh, little orange thing. Uh, so it's voltage sensitive. And wh when the voltage changes, it's, it, it goes and blocks the channel. Now, these guys out here, you know, are voltage sensitive as well. And they act quicker and they, you know, these guys open, open the channel. But even when the channel has been opened by these guys, this little inactivation particle sort of like flops in, also voltage sensitive, and blocks the channel. So, so the bottom line is that you can sort of, you can, so, you know, inactivation is just a part of this protein uh, that, that actually, uh, of this channel protein, this, this whole thing is, uh, you know, is one voltage gated, you know, sodium channel, sodium channel protein. So I, th this picture is in the, uh, in the class notes, so you can sort of look at it. And, and, and I, I, put, I, put, I put the reference in there, too. OK, so let's uh, get rid of the overlay, uh, David. OK, so, so that, was, that was one of those voltage-gated fast sodium channels. There's a bunch of them. I, I just said there was one, but there's a lot of different ones, slightly different from each other. So, so now let's, tr and, and those are responsible for the spike, but now let's turn to other voltage-gated channels because there's a whole forest of them. And, you know, what are, what are these channels? Well, these are the, the channels that all the pharmaceutical companies are after are trying to sort of like modify these, these channels with different, uh, different drugs. But they also when in, under the normal operation, they sort of work cooperatively to sort of keep cells within a, a good operating range. And this is a little more d difficult than you might at first think. So, so think about cells. They can spike. Uh, they can make action potentials. And what, you know, what can they do? Well, they can sort of change the rate of action potentials, to, you know, from like hardly any, like, you know, one or two per second, up to maybe some cells can go as fast as a couple hundred per second, but a lot of cells in the cortex, they won't go much above, like, say, 50 per second. So there's not a, it's not a big dynamic range of how many, what's the rate of spiking that you can do. And now let's consider that dynamic range. At the top of the end, uh, if you go off the edge at the top, what happens is you get some kind of epileptic discharge where there's activity, abnormal activity spreading across uh, the cortex and disabling any kind of, you know, computations going on. On the other hand, if you don't have enough spikes, then you're dead uh, because, you know, spikes have to, you have to have some spikes to talk. And so there's a lot of hardware, a lot of extremely robust uh, channel hardware that is, uh, is set up to sort of keep neurons in a nice, a nice sort of middle range where they're not spiking too much and they're not uh, and they're not spiking not enough like dead uh, and so this is an extremely robust system it's been just just consider that you know you personally are you know come from a lineage of cells that never died for for three and a half billion years so there's a perfect lineage of cells that gave rise to you that never died for for three billion years so these systems, you know, evolution is harsh. All the ones that weren't robust enough uh, were, were selected out. So you've got these incredibly robust systems. And, um, and we don't really, you know, understand in great detail how they work, especially because they got like, you know, a couple thousand parts. But let's just talk about, say, 20 of the parts. So, so we'll start off with um, uh, excitatory... Uh, currents. So, talk about excitatory. And sometimes these are called, you know, because it's mainly s sodium and calcium, uh, sometimes these are called inward currents, if you read in the literature, inward, because, you know, uh, so there's more sodium outside and it goes in uh, if you open a channel for it. So, these are, are sodium uh, and calcium. 
and there's more calcium uh, also, so they, they go in. Uh, and what are we looking here? So we're looking at, um, at our, um, I'm going to draw, uh, draw up at the top what we did with the voltage clamp. So these are voltage clamp studies where we essentially uh, turn the voltage clamp on, control the voltage so we can see what the dynamics of the channel, you know, the activation and the inactivation of the channel are. So, um, so we're going to mainly be looking at currents. So th the very top line is going to be the voltage clamp, which is voltage. Uh, but all the graphs under it are currents, okay? So here's our excitatory inward current channels. So, uh, so the first one that, uh, well, sorry, let's put the, I'll put it in a different color. So here's the voltage clamp. So the voltage clamp is starting, say we start at, you know, minus 70, and then jam it up to, say, minus 10, and then just hold it there. So that's millivolts. So, so that's the, that guy is the voltage clamp. So that, that's what we did to the, uh, uh, to the cell to open the channels because these are, these are voltage gated uh, channels. And so we open them with, with the voltage clamp, but then we held the voltage constant so we can sort of measure how the current is changing. So, so that's the uh, voltage clamp. Okay, so now here's a dividing line the dividing line and now we're going to have current under here so voltage above you know current current below so that's the voltage clamp so now let's look at look at the channel so the the one i talked about last time was the they're they're often labeled by just i for current and then some subscript and so i n a is the fast sodium is a name for the fast sodium current. And so, so what happens when we uh, turn on the voltage clamp, that guy, that guy opens up uh, and, and then it, it inactivates. So even though the voltage clamp is, so remember we're starting at zero. And so what, you know, what, what's, so w what the y-axis here is millivolts, what the y-axis here uh, is is current. So that's that's uh, current. So so we start at zero. So there's there's zero, and so what happens? This is the fast sodium, and so we're going to talk about some slower currents. And so this guy's really fast, so it goes up really quickly, and then it dies away really quickly. So last time I drew it like, I drew it like you know something like this. Okay, that's the same thing on this scale. So this is time going here and you know time time going here. Okay, so that's the fast sodium current. Uh, I'll put that one in red so we can I'll leave it put in green. How about green? Green's I got a new green marker. Okay, there there we go. So this guy just comes on and goes off really fast. Fast sodium current. So this guy is uh, fast sodium. But there's a whole menagerie of other, uh, of other currents. And so, so here's, here's another example of a current. And what do we mean by current? Typically, we just mean another protein, another protein that makes a channel in the membrane and that's sitting in the membrane with all these other channels. So, uh, so our next one is... Um, um, it's called persistent. And so this is another one that actually just stays on. So this guy, this guy uh, basically uh, starts off at zero again. Uh, and then it doesn't come on as quickly, but it doesn't inactivate. So, so this guy is called I current N A comma P for persistent. <laughs> Let me just make that a little neater. So N A persistent. And so so this guy um, 
persistent. So, so that one is, is kind of like the delayed rectifier. It doesn't inactivate. You just depolarize, it turns on. Uh, so now there's uh, uh, some calcium, uh, calcium currents. Uh, but they're inward and they e excite the cell. And so here's, here's a calcium current. So a calcium current. And this guy is, you know, relatively, uh, relatively long. So that one, it inactivates, but very slowly compared to the, you know, to this original one. So I am my color scheme straight. Okay, so here's INA. This guy is current sodium persistent. This guy is current long. So this guy is just called long. Uh, and this one is a calcium current, some sodium, but it's a calcium current. So, um, and then we've got another one called, which I'm going to talk about what this one actually does to the cell. It's another calcium current, but it's, uh, it's called uh, transient. Now, it's not as transient. Uh, so this guy is um, transient. <laughs> it's not as transient as the, uh, as the sodium channel, but, but it has a slightly different time course there. So this guy is named current transient. Um, and there's another one called neither, neither. So that one is, is it's, it's not quite as, uh, this guy is also, you know, a calcium current. There's another one that's, um, that, you know, isn't quite as transient, but it's not quite as long as the other one. So there's yet another one in there. So you can see there's this whole sort of forest of all these guys interacting with each other. Because it turns out, what's the, what's the relevance of calcium? Cal some channels are dependent on calcium for their opening. So when these channels open, uh, they not only depolarize, and that changes things, but the calcium goes in, and the calcium can affect other channels. So... Um, so this guy is, you know, neither. It's neither uh, quite as transient or... So that one is called uh, uh, current N there. Okay, so... So there's also um, uh, a another dividing line here because there's there's a weird current uh, that is actually is actually activated by hyperpolarization so here we have another a different voltage clamp uh, curve so so this this voltage clamp we start at zero and then go down to say you know very negative think like yeah minus like minus 100 so start at zero so this is the this is the voltage clamp again here and when you do that it turns out there's actually there's actually another current that uh, it's an excitatory current that comes on so it starts at, at zero. So all of these guys are zero because the channel. This means the channel is closed. So don't 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 mix up the voltage clamp with the with the current. So so what happens with this guy is this guy is is off <coughs> at zero, and when this voltage clamp comes on, um, it it actually just goes up. So this that's a, it's, it's another sodium and calcium one, but notice this is it's. It's like the, an inverse spike current. So the spike current, like this guy, what happens is you open the channel, and if you depolarize, you open the channel, and it makes it more depolarized. Th this one is weird. You, if you hyperpolarize the channel, make it very, you know, inhibit a lot, this one comes on. 
you can sort of see how these things might interact with each other. Like if you just got too inhibited, this is like a, a fail safe. Just come on, just turn, turn, turn it on, just keep things going, don't die. <laughs> so, um, so, this, um, so this, this guy is, is, is a sodium and, and calcium current that, uh, that is, is activated by hyperpolarization. Okay, so those are all, <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of, you know, excitatory, excitatory uh, inward currents. But now let's, let's have uh, a bunch of inhibitory currents. And so the inhibitory currents Sometimes a synonym for them is uh, outward uh, because generally, generally these are um, potassium currents and uh, there's more potassium inside and so when you open up a potassium channel, the potassium uh, goes out. It's positive. When it goes out, it causes inhibition. Not all. There, there's other other. In other ones, but that's, this is the main one. And so what we're going to do now is just look at the same thing. Uh, just look at the same, uh, sa same picture here for, at the same approximate time scale for, for all these uh, inhibitory currents when we do the same thing to the voltage clamp. Now, you notice I'm leaving out like a lot of the details, like how do we get these curves? Well, we've got to like somehow deal with all the other channels, right? Because they're in there too. So, you know, we, we've got to block, block some of the other channels or fiddle with the voltage clamp to try to keep those channels closed because we want just a curve that's coming from, you know, the persistent sodium current. So, we, so in that case, we would need to block, you know, the, the, the fast sodium current so that we can sort of see this one. Otherwise, there'll be these other spikes on it from this guy. So yeah, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite a complicated mess, but we're, we're just sort of uh, giving you the bottom line. So... The first one that we talked about before was the, the delayed rectifier. So that one, you know, it starts at zero again. And, and, and this guy is non-inactivating. So if you just depolarize with the voltage clamp, so this is the same, same thing we're doing with the voltage clamp. We're just jamming it up to minus 10 and keeping it there. So that's time going in this direction. It's, you know, it's time here. All these graphs are time. So, so this guy is the, you know, IK. So that's the, so that's the delayed rectifier. The rectifier meaning the thing that puts things back right. So this is delayed rectifier. Okay, so we talked about that one. We talked about that one last time. So we talked about that one last time and this one last time. Um, but um, but there's more. So um, here's another one called IC. I can't remember what the C stands for. But uh, this guy is sort of um, sort of similar. But this guy inactivates. I don't have that lined up. Sorry about that, guys. This is uh, supposed to be all lined up here. So this is the voltage clamp starting at, say, minus 70 and then going up to minus 10. We could even start lower, lower than minus 70, but that's, that's good enough. Okay, so that's the delayed rectifier. So, so here's another, I'm going to make that one just a little faster. So this, this other IC current is not quite as fast as the delayed rectifier. So it... Uh, it turns on, you know, a little slower, and it and it goes off. And this guy is, it's a potassium channel, like the delayed rectifier. So this guy's a potassium channel, but it's also calcium dependent. So now you're starting to see some of these interactions. So this, so this guy's letting in calcium, and when this guy lets in calcium, it's going to affect how this IC, you know, calcium channel dependent, I think that's what this, the C stands for calcium, calcium dependent um, channel opens up. Um, so there's another current, it was originally discovered in, in snails, but you know, 
everybody everybody needs their currents uh, and that's that's called the a current you can see we're sort of rapidly running out of uh, out of letters uh, so it's often in the literature it's just called the a current and this guy i'll talk about this one on how it can modulate uh, some of the cells so this one's quite transient it's quite a transient one and it inactivates pretty quickly like that so this guy is you know it's a potassium channel uh but it's you know transient so unlike this guy uh you know the the delayed rectifier uh it actually and so, so this one is just usually called a current <laughs> A current, that's the name of that guy. Um, so then there's another one uh, the, uh, called the M current. That's the, the, a lot of these are named after poison. So muscarin is a, is a, a poison in, a mush, in mushroom. And so this is another very slow uh, channel that comes on like this. It's another potassium channel. That, had, uh, that, is, that can be poisoned with muscarin, which is one of these, these mush mushroom poisons. And then there was a whole series of channels that were discovered in flies. And they were originally called, uh, they were originally called shaker. So these, this is, and the name for them is, is current K uh, V uh, one to four. And so, so this is a very interesting set of, uh, set of channels. So when they first started studying these, they, f they found, oh, there's a whole bunch of different ones and they have different, they all have different time courses. So there's some that are, are, are pretty transient. And then there's other ones that are, you know, a little less transient. And there's other ones that are, you know, even less transient. And then there's other ones that are, you know, even less transient. And they have all different names, funny names, like uh, they start with SH. So there was like Shaw and Shab and Shell and Shaker. So the original one is called Shaker because that's how they figured this out. Like they got some flies, mutant flies that were shaking. And so they said, oh, let's see what's wrong with their channels. Something was wrong with the shaker channel. But the interesting thing about these is that, you know, it's biology. So these are made by alternate RNA splicing. Amazing. Alternate RNA splicing. So in your immune system, the way you make antibodies is the immune cells kind of randomly take like one from column A and one from column B for the antibody, the gene for the antibody protein, and they slightly inaccurately splice it, sort of like, you know, so like sometimes leave out a couple nucleotides, sometimes add a few more. And so what happens is you get a whole variety. This is actually DNA splicing. You get a whole variety of immune cells that are all differently spliced and they make different antibodies. And then your body somehow f sorts through this mess and figures out which one is sticking to the bad guys, and then it amplifies that one. So that's, that's kind of like alternate DNA splicing in an immune system. This is alternate RNA splicing. So what you do is you transcribe the gene, you, know, you, you, tr you turn the gene into RNA, and then you, you know, in one case you attach, you know, these two things together, and in another case, you, you know, take a little bit more of this uh, before you attach it to this guy. And so it's, it's, so you alternately splice the same gene, and you get all these different channels. Uh, so that's the, that's, that's shaker. Um, and then finally, um, um, there's another one called another common one called AHP for after hyperpolarizing. <laughs> uh, that's a well-known current. And so this guy, it's, it's calcium dependent, starts off at zero, and then it, um, it sort of very slowly inactivates. So that's a, 
th these are these are all calcium channels. So this is calcium channel. I mean, uh, 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 sorry, uh, potassium channels. Sorry, and these are all this. This is a potassium channel that's you know calcium dependent. And then finally, uh, one last. There's one I'll talk about when we get to the basal ganglia. It's called the it's called the anomalous rectifier. This guy is, I'll just call it uh, anomalous rectifier. So this one, this one is a weird uh, channel that when we turn the voltage clamp hyperpolarizing, so if we go, say, you know, start at minus 10 and then make it, say, you know, minus 90, so that's the voltage clamp, uh, the channel, it's an inhibitory channel, but it's actually turned on by inhibition. So it's, it's kind of the, rev so, so these guys, the, the potassium channel, it's turned on by excitation. So if you excite the cell, depolarize it, then this rectifier comes in to set things right and inhibit the cell to get it sort of, you know, get it back to rest. So this guy is the, this guy's a rectifier. This current down here is a weird one. It's, um, so this is the, this is the voltage clamp. So what happens with this one is when you, so it starts off at zero, it's closed. When it's depolarized, when you hyperpolarize it, it turns on. <laughs> so, that's kind of weird. It's kind of like an inverse spike current. So the spike current is like is has positive feedback because what happens when you when you w what opens the channel? What opens the fast sodium channel? Depolarization. What happens when you open the fast sodium channel? You get more depolarization. So it's a positive feedback situation. So the channel opens causes more depolarization that 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 causes more channels to open and then the whole it's like a you know it's like a fire. It's suddenly like spikes up and then inactivation luckily comes in and, and turns it off so that everything doesn't blow up. This one is kind of like that except from the inhibitory domain. So what it, what it is is if you're at rest, it's off. But if you, if you push down on the cell a little bit, the current suddenly comes on and, and then the, the cell will become more hyperpolarized. So, so that's why it's called the anomalous rectifier. In, um, uh, this it's like a, it's a screwed up rectifier that's going in the wrong direction. <laughs> it's, it's like really rectifying uh, when you're already rectified. <laughs> so we'll talk about that when we talk about the basal ganglia. It's an interesting current may, may be involved in, in, uh, in how we sort of switch uh, cells in and out of circuits uh, in the basal ganglia. Okay, so that was a whole class on channelology. Just, uh, just so you, you know some of these names, there's this whole forest of channels that are all interacting. So, you know, what, is it, what does it look like? Well, you've got like one channel here, maybe that one lets in some calcium, and that opens another channel that inhibits. You know, when you get inhibited, th th this channel opens up and uh, tries to excite you, and then when you get too excited, this one sort of... Uh, opens up another channel. So they're all interacting with each other. They've got all different time constants. So you get this complicated sort of meshwork like this. And, what, and what's the goal? Well, the goal was worked out by evolution. Uh, we've got this complicated homeostatic network. And if it's just trying to sort of keep everybody in a happy space where they're spiking enough, but not spiking too little. Uh, and it's all interactive, you know, complicated interactions. So when you look at this, it's obvious why most pharmaceutical drugs don't work. Why do they not work? Well, you come in, like if we come in with a, you know, pharmaceutical drug that just binds to one of these nodes, what's going to happen? Well, the other nodes are going to instantly react. So say you turn this node down too much, what's going to happen? All the other nodes are going to say, oh, I, I, I'm not getting enough excitation. Uh, there's not enough excitation, so I'm going to 
do whatever I need to cancel that out. And that's one of the reasons why you have such anomalous effects from what should be like a simple drug that's just going in and affecting one channel. So, I mean, the, the, one of the clearest examples is just think of alcohol. You drink a bunch of alcohol, it opens your GABA channels. I didn't talk about them yet, but it opens your GABA channels. And what does the brain say? Well, there's not enough excitation. And so what does it do? It just jacks up the excitation to cancel out the alcohol. So these things happen with all different time courses. You know, some of them happen very rapidly. Other ones take like, you know, a couple hours to happen. But it's a complicated system and it doesn't respond the way you would think it does. You know, like you, if you just touch one node strongly, like suppress one node or elevate one node, the whole rest of the system is going to say, oh, I'm going to try to fix that and cancel it out. So, yeah, so the, the, the pharmaceutical companies don't like to, they, they want to focus on just the one node as if the one node was sort of doing the whole thing, but it's not. Uh, it, it's a complicated system like this. And just to take one example, take, take um, what a hormone does to your genes. If, you, if, a, if a hormone gets into a cell, it's going to affect 10% of your genes. So there's about 20,000 genes, so it's going to tweak 2,000 genes. That's the way the system actually works. Uh, it, you, you, you tweak like, you know, 1,000 genes in order to sort of like cause something to happen. You just don't go to one node and just like slam one node down. Okay, so it's enough of a sermon about uh, sort of complicated uh, interacting networks. So let's just talk now about... Um, uh, what can we do with some of these currents? Okay, so, uh, so we'll give two examples. One, one with the A current, and then one with the... I'll start off with, the, with that transient current. So just to sort of see how you can actually, uh, actually use some of these hardware pieces or how they're used, uh, used in the cell. So, um, so let's start off... Let's start off with the RK plus, forgot to put that there. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about now is, is how the, um, uh, how uh, the transient current uh, can control bursting. So, how the transient controls bursting. And so what is, uh, you're probably groaning now, bursting. What's bursting? Well, bursting, uh, a good example of burst cells that we'll talk about later in the class are the cells that uh, control your eye muscles. So how do your eye muscles work? Well, you've got like a, your eye is like a ball bearing, r relatively frictionless ball bearing. And when you want to look at something new, what happens is, there's a muscle that say, say I want to look at something off to the right, there's a muscle pulling on the right side of my eye and it gives the eyeball a little yank, a really quick little yank. And then the eyeball sort of moves, just a, just a transient yank. The eyeball moves through the orbit and then when it gets to the right place, the opposite muscle on the other side of the eyeball gives another little burst, exactly time burst to stop the eyeball from moving. Now, this all happens very rapidly, like in about 20 milliseconds. That's a 50th of a second. The whole eye movement takes place in a 50th of a second. And so that little burst has to be even shorter than that. It's a, just a tiny little burst that just hammers the muscle. And so it's a, it's a rapid set of spikes that, uh, that will sort of like go out to the muscle. And so sometimes you need to do this. You, instead of just one or two spikes, you gotta go and just give a little burst of like five or 10 spikes. So it turns out you can take a single cell and make it burst sometimes and make it not burst using the transient, using this, this IT current. And this was initially worked out in the, in the lobster stomach. So the lobsters, you know, lobsters eat a lot of different kind of things, you know, that they pick up, you know, from the ground in the ocean. And uh, the stomach is kind of intelligent. So you put something down in there that's like, really hard and the, and the little lobster stomach, stomatogastric, stomatogastric ganglion, which is the thing that controls the stomach, will sense, oh, that's a kind of a hard thing. So let's, let's get the 
let's get that bursting thing going where we can sort of, and there's little teeth down in the lobster stomach so we can chew that stuff up. But then, you, you know, then it eats like some rotten piece of hamburger or something that's kind of nice and soft. And then, and then it changes over to this, to this more rhythmic, um, uh, less bursty kind of pattern of firing. But it's the same cell. It's the same cell. And so, so how does this work? So this, this, it just puts together two channels, but it, g it gives you some idea of like, you know, wh what you have to do to actually sort of work, work these things out. So, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're just going to actually start with an actual stimulus and not turn the voltage clamp on. So this is, uh, this is a stimulus, a stimulus current, stim current. No voltage clamp. So, so we just we just stimulate the cell, and um, so and, and under two different conditions. And so the first the first condition, we're going to uh, start around um, say minus eighty five millivolts. So start off with the cell around. We might have to use a voltage clamp to get it to minus 85 millivolts. So let's start the cell around 85 millivolts. And so what happens? So what happens is, uh, if we look at the, you know, if we just look at what what the cell does, what we see is that the you know the cell is going to go up and fire a whole bunch of spikes right in a row. That's a burst. So it just goes. So it fires a whole bunch of spikes right in a row. And they, they get a little smaller as, as time goes on and spread out. And then, they, and then it goes off eventually. So that guy, that guy's a burst, some rapid you know, burst of spikes. It's a rapid set of spikes. And so by uh, poisoning the so, so what, what was this? This wasn't a particular channel. This was just the membrane potential of the cell. So this is just the, because we're, n we're not voltage clamping it, so we're just letting it go. So this is, you know, millivolts, uh, membrane potential of cell. Okay, so we just see a, we just see a little burst like that. Now, if we, if we now go and look at the, you know, look at the, the transient current, so in other words, like poison stuff around and just see what's going on with the transient current. So, uh, so here's the same thing, but now, so this, this was the membrane potential of the cell, but now let's just look at the, at the current going through, uh, going through the, the, I, the IT current. So this is uh, this guy right here. So it should just go up and just go up and go down, right? So this is this guy's millivolts, and now this direction is current. Okay, so this is the I T current. So now what happens uh, is it, it goes up, but then it starts to get some little spikes in it that just happen to match those, and then it goes down. So what are those spikes in current? So those little spikes in current. So that's basically, that's basically just Ohm's law. <laughs> Ohm's law. Because what's going on in the cell is the cell, because, you know, remember, you know, current, you know, uh, current equals voltage times conductance. And so what happens when a spike happens, when the fast sodium channels open up and a spike happens, the cell, uh, the membrane potential changes a lot, also known as, also known as this guy. So even though the conductance, so this is, you know, this is, you know, membrane potential, and this guy is, you know, conductance of channel. So the conductance of channel uh, hasn't changed very much. It, it you know, it, it, it opened up and then closed, that's, that's supposed to be this, this uh, curve over here. It opened up and closed, but what are the spikes? Well, the spikes are because the sodium, the fast sodium channel 
change the membrane potential, it's going to make more current go through for the same conductance. So, and so more current is going to come through because of those, those, those spikes. But basically, if we, if we somehow had just opened it like we did here by, after we poisoned the fast sodium channel, then you would just see what I drew before. You would just see something coming up like that and then going down like that. There wouldn't be any spikes in it. Okay, so, so this thing is an extra excitatory current that, that helps the cell spike because it's got this little pedestal of current and so then this, the cell can spike again more quickly because it's, it, it's a little bit depolarized even after the spike and even after the delayed rectifier kicked in. Okay, so that's a burst. But it turns out the exact same cell, if we just start the cell, cell, you know, around minus 60 millivolts, behaves completely differently. So what happens if you, if you, um, if you do it at 60 millivolts? Uh, well, what, uh, it just looks like a regular squid axon. It just, it just spikes and spikes and spikes. It just looks like regular non-bursting. So these are, so these are sort of, you know, non-bursting spikes. And so what's going on here? Well, it turns out if we look at this IT channel, and I if you come on Friday, we'll go through all, all the, in the advanced session, we'll go through all the hodgkin Huxley equations, but let's just sort of really whip, a, whip them out really quickly here. So we have two different things going on. We've got, you know, which I mentioned in the, in the first lecture, we've got activation and inactivation. And so here's, here's a graph of activation and inactivation. So this guy, this guy is activation. And so activation is, uh, and th this is the, the in inactivation variable, which just goes from zero to one, the activation and the inactivation variable. And this guy is uh, inactivation over here. In activation. So basically when, and, and then finally, the most critical, what's the graph, what, what are we graphing here? So we're graphing uh, millivolts. So this is activation as a function, you know, of, and we've got, say, about minus 80 over here and about minus 65 over here. So, so how does the inactivation and inactivation work again? Just to review what we did last time, we said if you depolarize the cell, which means like go in this direction, you activate. That opens the channel. But at the same time, when you depolarize the cell, you inactivate. And, and when you inactivate, now the channel is closed. And so the channel will only open up in this little region down here. This is the only, this is the only place where the channel is open. So if, you, if you're too hyperpolarized, the channel is closed because there's no activation. If you're too depolarized, the channel is also closed because there's inactivation. So, so that's, what's causing, that's what's causing this. So if you start around 60 millivolts, what happens is this channel gets inactivated. So, so what will, you know, so what, this, this was the membrane potential, just to fill out the membrane potential. And then the, the equivalent graph here of, you know, what's happening in the IT channel, nothing, not a, So th this was the, this was the IT current. So there's the, so let me put a, so that's our, that's our stim current. Here's like, you know, the, the, the first, first condition, and then here's the second condition. So what that shows is it's exactly the same cell, but we can, 
com completely change its behavior from you know bursting to this just regular non-bursting spikes. You know we could call those regular spiking. This is kind of the way the squid axon would respond because there's no there's no transient current uh, in the in the squid axon. You just if you inject current, you get some spikes. You inject current, you get a few more spikes, but they're not sort of clustered together in these little bursts. So that shows you how you can sort of modulate the, the performance of these cells and get them into different modes. So it makes it, it's a lot more complicated than like an artificial neural network where you have a very simple, a, a simple kind of unit. Uh, the, these are like dynamic units. They can do all different kinds of things just by fiddling around with this with this forest of you know interacting, uh, interacting channels. So, um, so, so that's how transient current can control bursting and cause different behavior out of the exact same neuron just by slightly depolarizing it. So, how would you do this? You, somebody would slightly depolarize the membrane, not enough to cause it to spike, just like just jack it up a little bit. That shuts down the transient channels, and then suddenly you got this, this other behavior. Okay, so I'll just talk just for like two or three minutes uh, about this, this other, so we, so we were talking about this guy over here. Uh, let, let's talk about this, uh, an A current. So what could we do with this? What could we do with this A current? So, so for the A current, we, we could say like how you know, A current can cause a delay. Now, why do we need to delay? Well, when we talk about the auditory system in particular, it's not just the auditory system, but, you know, maybe we want to measure what the delay in a response is. Or, if, or when we talk about the visual system, Maybe we want to see what direction an object is going. And in order to do that, the circuitry needs a little delay inserted into some of the elements. So the cell is excited, but then it doesn't immediately spike. It just has a, a, a fixed delay, and then it spikes. And that's another kind of circuit element that we might want to fiddle around with, where we, you know, we can sort of have a variable delay depending on what, you know, what kind of channels we open up. And the A current could do something like that. So how would that work? Well, you would just basically open that inhibitory A current, but then it would rapidly inactivate. And then once it went away, then you would get a, a response. So instead of, so, so the idea is if the A current is not on, and here's, this is your stimulation current. It, it's not a, not a voltage stem current, not voltage clamp, not voltage clamp. So we just inject some current, see what happens. So, so what happens if we don't turn the A current on? Uh, what's going to happen is, you know, the cell, the cell will almost immediately start spiking. But if we turn the A current on, what can happen is the cell can get inhibited for a little bit, say 20 milliseconds or something like that, 30 milliseconds, inhibited. And it, even though it's being excited, it's being excited here. So this is the, this is, you know, the stimulus, and this is just the cell membrane potential. So this is a cell membrane potential with IA. So, yeah, slightly off the edge. Okay, cell membrane potential with with the A current come on. So if the A current comes on, what it can do is it can just shut the cell down temporarily, uh, just for say 30 milliseconds, and then potential with I A. Okay, got it on there. So what will happen is you just inhibit the cell hard, and then after a while, since you're still exciting, you know, then you'll get some spikes. And so this, 
So this is basically a little circuit element that, that can introduce a delay. And depending on like, you know, how, you know, how we arrange that in cells, that's, you know, it can introduce a delay. So this gives you, this is just one out of many complicated examples of how these, these things all uh, interact with each other. So the, the first one was how we could sort of modulate the firing pattern of a, of a cell, change it from a burst to regular spiking. And the second one was, what if we just need to introduce a delay? So we can, we can use this inhibitory current to kind of slam the cell down, even though it's being excited, and then it inactivates quickly and then allows the cell, after it inactivates, then it allows the cell to be, uh, to be excited. Okay, so I'll um, end the overly verbose uh, recording there and see if we have any, any questions about this.